Jochen Bauerjahn to Cumbra Ministry area for that opening act of worship. And Kreuzo Balb, welcome to our diocesan conference. The theme of the conference, just in case it has passed your notice, is welcome. And there'll be an opportunity later in the conference to discuss the practicalities of how we become a church that is truly welcoming. For my part, I want to explore the notion of welcome with you from three perspectives. What is it? Why do it? And how does it look? Some of you may have heard of or even been involved in Back to Church Sunday. It began in the States in 2009 and was an initiative that designated the third Sunday in September as a day when churches would focus on inviting people back to church. The emphasis was on those who had been churchgoers, had perhaps even been brought up to go to church, but who had lapsed over the years for one reason or another. Special resources were made available, banners, posters, sermon outlines, tips for attracting people back into the fold. I remember thinking at the time when it reached the United Kingdom and became a thing to do, that for all the good intentions that lay behind it, it wasn't likely to have any lasting impact. Wel welcoming people into or back to church has to be more than a one-off event, however good, exciting or attractive that one event is. Welcome has to be part of the mindset of a church community, an intrinsic part of its culture, if it's going to feel authentic to those who dare to step through our doors. It has to be part of our DNA and not just a special effort on a special occasion. St. Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, urges the Christian community to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Our welcome to others has to be an extension of God's welcome to us. And we know what that feels like. George Herbert's well-known poem sums it up beautifully and movingly. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. The poem explores what it feels like when you're invited by the God who is love to come and share at his table when you feel wretched, unworthy, ashamed. Love not only invites, but draws near, speaks tenderly, reassures, and reminds us that love has borne the blame and overcome all our unworthiness and sin. This is our story of a God whose love heals and transforms us as he invites us ever more deeply into a relationship with him. Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you. Our invitation to others must mirror God's invitation to us all. The welcome we offer is not to be limited or partial, not with strings attached, not you're welcome as long as you fit in with how it is here. Rather, come and join us as we ourselves seek to join with God in Christ. 
it would be very easy and very understandable to want to become a more welcoming church just so that our numbers increase. But that should not be our primary motivation. Because if it is, then our welcome is likely to come across as inauthentic and false. We welcome the stranger, the newcomer, because in doing so, we are welcoming Christ himself. I never cease to be challenged by the parable towards the end of St. Matthew's Gospel about the sheep and the goats. Those who are welcomed into the kingdom by the Son of Man are not those who attend public worship regularly or know their Bibles or pray faithfully every day. It's those who are kind and generous and compassionate to those in need. It's those who welcome the stranger. And what is very clearly stated is that just as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. When she was asked how she managed to work day by day in the filth and squalor of what was then Calcutta, tending the sick, the dying and the maimed, lying in the streets amidst the flies and the stench, Mother Teresa famously said, I treat them all as if I was treating Jesus. In the light of Matthew's parable, that's exactly what she was doing. And it's what we are called to do at the doors and gates of our church buildings, if not in the streets of our towns and city. To see all those who come as Jesus himself. To serve all those who come as if we were serving the one who came to show us what it means to serve one another. To share what we know of the love of God in what we say and what we do. And thereby be a blessing to others. But this is not all one way. We also have to recognise that they can be a blessing to us, a gift from God, if we can accept them for who they are and are willing to receive what they have to give. When I was a higher education chaplain, I occasionally used to sit in on the History of Art course. One day, a woman turned up to the class. Her appearance caused a bit of a stir, especially when we realised that she was the one to give the lecture. <laughs> she was dressed in stiletto shoes and fishnet tights. She had a very short, tight-fitting skirt and a similarly tight, and low slung top. She was heavily made up and her hair was long and quite wild. For all the world, she looked like a lady of the night. <laughs> After the first session and the mid-morning break, she returned, hardly recognisable and every inch what you would expect a lecturer to look like. We spent the second session exploring attitudes, prejudices, and how we make assumptions about people based on their appearance. <coughs> I can't remember anything about the lecture, <laughs> but I learnt a lot about myself that day. It's said that we make judgments about people within seconds of first seeing them, and our subsequent behaviour towards them is influenced as a result. If we want to be truly welcoming to anyone who turns up at our doors, 
then we not only need to accept them as they are, we need to take care to treat them as children of God, whatever they look like and however they present. John Hull was a former professor of practical theology at Queen's Birmingham, Queen's Birmingham and wrote extensively about his experience of being blind. People would speak about me to others as if I wasn't there, he said, just because I was blind. They would ask others what I wanted, even on one occasion asking my wife if I wanted to be taken up to the communion rail, rather than asking me myself. So often in public situations, it was the does he take sugar syndrome, as if I was stupid or deaf just because I used a white stick. To be a truly welcoming church means creating a space so that newcomers, strangers, seekers can feel and know that they belong. It means embracing what they bring, receiving what they have to share, and being prepared to change and be changed by their presence amongst us. The Church in Wales has a new Bishop of St David's, and his presence on the bench will change the dynamic we have created between us. It will disrupt, and rightly so, the ways we do things and the things we do. It will require the rest of us not just to welcome him with words, but accommodate him and make space for him, such that he can take his place amongst us and truly belong. As we explore the practicalities of welcome later this morning, let's not forget the fundamental reason for seeking to be a welcoming church. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, for all are equally loved and redeemed in the sight of God. All are welcome to sit and eat in his house at his table. God welcomes stranger as well as friend into the body of Christ. Amen.